I'm a brain doctor, or at least um, I'm a retired brain doctor. And uh, I'm a disappointed person, but as, as you can see from my socks, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. <laughs> and so, as I was coming up to retirement about five years before it, in fact, I thought, we've got to change things. The medicine I'm talking about is medicine of the brain. It's something that we do in the same way we've always done. And it, we've been doing it for 150 years and we're still not very good at it when it comes to the brain. I mean, you all know people who are usually young who suffer from psychiatric disease. Usually for many years, never cured. Many of you now will know parents, grandparents who are losing their minds. Dementing. And then those last terrible years where everyone has to look after them or put them into a home or whatever. We're 30% wrong with the cause of the dementia. 30%. Even in, you know, Mass General, London, Paris, Lausanne, you know, the great centres of neurology. So we've got to do something about this. And as we were thinking about this, a couple of mates and myself, a computer scientist, a neuroscientist, and me, a clinical scientist, we thought that the real thing that's missing is the impact of computers and informatics on medicine. In fact, you, the patients, have been much better at this than we, the doctors. I mean, you come in, usually with a pile of things like this off the internet, about your disease. And then we suddenly find ourselves being a bit silly because we are not as up-to-date as you are. So we set up this Human Brain Project, a billion euros, 10 years, 70 principal investigators, lots of institutions, 23 countries, 10 years to try and understand how the brain is organised and to understand what disease does to it, what are the mechanisms underlying disease, how can we find better treatments. So this is reasonably big. And the first thing we had to do was find out what resources do we have? And then we thought to ourselves, which clicker are we going to use? <laughs> hey, it worked. So, the resources that we have are data. Every hospital has banks of data about its patients for at least 10 years. Secure. Uncorruptible. Guarded against people looking into your private lives. In fact, unused. You only use 5 to 8% of those data for follow-up patients. The rest is used by lawyers to attack doctors who have done malpractice. And think of the money that's used to build data warehouses. Think of the energy that's used. Think of the lack of use and what immense wealth of knowledge and real wealth has been just left. And it's your wealth because we in Europe have socialised health systems largely. That means you, the taxpayers, are paying for that. And you're getting nothing back. So on the medical side we said to ourselves, we need to solve this problem. We need to solve this problem with our clinical data, of which there are vast amounts in Europe. But clinical data, which are not complete, not very structured, not very standardised, a bit dirty, and with all this protection around them. And also, research data. Now this comes from places like pharmaceutical companies, which hide them for commercial reasons. But if you go to a pharmaceutical company and say, how many of your trials, drug trials, succeed? And they say, oh, we're lucky if they 5%, 10% succeed. Give us the data from the ones that don't. Oh, they hand it to you. You just need to think about it. If you go to researchers, they say, oh, that's my data, I'm going to win my Nobel Prize. And you say, well, hang on a moment, it's not the data that wins the Nobel Prize, it's your brain, and your brain is clearly not up to it if you're hiding your data, because you need to share it, you need to find more of it, you need to get it all together, integrate it, federate it, integrate it, try and do something with it, with the ideas you have, not with hiding data, with passwords which you forget, and then corrupt things like that. So that's what we're going to use. And in fact, 
not only are we going to use it, we're going to use it to good effect. And here's just some examples. I've got three images here. People think of images like x-rays. You look at them, you make a diagnosis. Actually, images are like encyclopedias. Look at the image up there on the left. You saw a brain which was moving around. Now you're seeing the fibres between different parts of the brain. This is one brain that's been looked in multiple dimensions. 100,000 little picture elements. You could click on each one of those picture elements and potentially get all the world's literature about what happens there, what goes wrong there, what diseases affect this place. Why aren't we doing that? We're doing it in meteorology, so that you could get out your iPhone and see if it's going to rain without looking out the window. You, they do it in aeronautics, in building aircraft. They do it in astronomy, to discover how the universe expanded. But in medicine, trivial take-up. On the right there, you see a lovely little picture of nerve cells in the rat brain. Each nerve cell carries a function. And at the bottom, you see a really nice movie, because this one tells you, in picture form, how a rat brain evolves into a human brain over many, many, many millennia. So, pictures are there because they federate data, they integrate it, and they convey information. Look at this, we, we, we got a lot of information from researchers in France, and then from a big website in the States called the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. They just put their data on the web and said to scientists, use them. And we have used them, and we found lots of different bits of data. We found clinical data, we found scans, we found proteins, we found genes, they gave us all this stuff. And we found a way of integrating them together and seeing whether they form patterns. And what you see here in blue dots are patterns of different types of normal people between the ages of 50 and 90. And in pink, you see patterns of different types of dementia. And you might think, well, why different types of normal people? Well, the brain is an extraordinary thing. You have to lose a lot of brain to lose a cognitive function. In Parkinson's disease, you have to lose 70% of a particular set of brains to start beginning to show a bit of a tremble. There's that sort of reserve in there. And with Alzheimer's disease, for example, you can see post-mortem brains which have got quite a lot of Alzheimer's disease in it already, but the people think and act and behave normally. So there's compensation. So firstly, you would imagine there'll be normal aged people without any Alzheimer's and normal aged people who have compensated Alzheimer's. And we're beginning to find them. And the little black dots around them are different types of genes. And then there's another colour of dot around the yellow ones, which are different patterns of loss of brain, which you see on scans. And it's the computer that has pulled out of all the data, which we've federated first and integrated, these different patterns. And in fact, we can diagnose Alzheimer's disease now with an accuracy of 95% as compared to a full clinical workup in hospital of only 70%. So, these patterns are the important things. We call them disease signatures. And with these disease signatures, we want to completely transform our diagnostic catalogs. Diagnosis should not just be based on what the patient said and what you found when you examined him, but should be based on all the other information as well. So this is bringing in biology to the art of medicine in order to create disease signatures to allow us to visualize the data, to allow us to test hypotheses, to see whether something we think about a disease is correct or not using vast amounts of data. At the moment, in the medical literature, the big issues are, we can't reproduce our results. Why not? Because we have small little groups of patients. But every hospital has small little groups of patients. Put them all together, and then you really get the big picture. That's the idea behind it all. So, what we want to do is to move from down here, from the little molecules of DNA, which make up our genes, through the proteins, to the cells, to the way they link up, working out the rules 
which tell us how these things are structured and how they limit the way the next level can be structured. All the way up to cognition and love and memory and feeling and seeing and talking and understanding. So that when we're faced with patients who have abnormalities of these things, we know which areas of the brain we should be targeting, where we should focus our inquiry, how we can work out what sort of prognosis people with a particular disease signature had. So, this sort of investigation and examination of data about, for example, dementias, allows us to put the different disease signatures together. They're the little pink balls. And you can see that some of these pink balls appear to be related to other pink balls around them. Through the data that we've been able to acquire. Others form like little satellites all on their own. They clearly have a different mechanism. And we can't just tell that by ordinary doctrine. We've got to use computing. And just to really hammer the point home, we also have some proof that these different disease signatures mean something, because some of them tell you that you're going to lose your mind, the blue line, over a course of about eight years, those are months at the bottom. Whereas if you have a different pattern, then you don't lose your mind in the same way, or you lose it much more slowly. So this is real prognosis, and this is also prognosis of subgroups, so that when you apply your treatments, you know whether you're really having an effect or not having an effect. Now, of course, these sorts of things worry people, because many people still think of their doctor as part nurse, part person who has good taste, and uh, therefore puts good uh, furniture into their waiting room, and runs a good uh, appointment system. So, you've got, to, you've got to get away from that. You've got to move forward to someone who's more technically minded, who, who also has the human aspect, and no reason why she, or she should lose that, but may have colleagues who might be doing that side of things. But there's got to be a group of doctors who are in there trying to find out what is happening in the brain when it ages, when it goes mad, when it becomes demented. And we're facing issues in this program, most of which we've now sorted out. The main issues are the ethical issues of privacy. So our strategy is not to put data together in big warehouses and use up all the energy that that requires and all the space that requires and all the people to run that that requires. We've developed a new sort of software we're going to put in each hospital so that we will distribute our questions to all the hospitals, rather like you do when you're on your computer and you Google. So that our questions will go out and look for the information they require in the hospitals, and the hospitals will remain the same and will remain proprietors of their data. And then we will bring back just that information, so we'll never bring back any information about an individual to give us the answers. Now if that gives us the sorts of insights we're now getting, you as a patient will go to your doctor and say, can you please use that information these guys are sorting out? to see whether you're right, to see whether there might be other things that could help me. Make your doctor embrace the informatics revolution. Make medicine embrace the informatics revolution, because if we don't have that, then we will remain roughly in the state we are, and the tsunami of dementia and of psychiatric disease in the young, with all the suicides and even murders that come from untouched. That will be our responsibility. The other thing is, issues of consent and ethics and so on, most people like you, like me, are really quite happy about the fact there are ethics committees out there that have been really very good at managing research done as it currently is done, where you use a lot of data about individuals. So, in all the sociological surveys, when people say, who do you trust in the population? Doctors are always first. It's a bit silly, really, but doctors are always first. So, the population doctors have a special relationship. If we can build on that, build on the value and credibility of the science, you patients will be driving the revolution, and you really, really need to do that. You need to say, 
to someone who, when you go to a hospital or go to a doctor's surgery, says, can I use these data for research purposes? You need to be comfortable to say, yes, of course, as long as it's for medicine and not for nuclear war. Right? You need to be able to say that. It's your data, after all. You paid for it. But it's also a little bit my data, because I also paid for it through my taxes. And public health is one of our rights. Privacy is another right. We have to balance our rights. And at some stage, we have to be very careful how we do that balancing. But balance we must and choose we must. We have the technology now to do all this. We've put it together into something called the Medical Informatics Platform. We're going to now develop it over the next two years so that we can make a network of six hospitals in Tel Aviv, in Lausanne, in Paris, in Freiburg, in, in Germany, uh, potentially in London, uh, and in Milan. We're going to show that it works, and then we're going to put it out to tender and get some European company to start putting it into our hospitals and start raising the game. Thank you very much for listening.